proud to have um, another and a very distinguished speaker in our series on Israeli Hebrew literature. And uh, it is really a privilege for me tonight to introduce to you one of Israel's not only most celebrated, but I would say also most versatile writers, Meir Shalev, who is in fact the same age as the State of Israel. I didn't give away anything. <laughs> he, was, he was born in Nahalal, which is, I believe, the oldest moshav in Israel. And his family history is also very much tied to the State of Israel. And therefore, I would say it is not surprising that his writings over several decades now cover the essential topics, or many of the essential topics, that are part and parcel of Israeliness. Among them are issues of the biblical heritage of Israeli society and Jewish identity, the story of early Russian immigrants to Eretz Israel, the special relationship to Jerusalem, and also, especially in his latest book, To the Nature of Israel. Meir Shalev studied psychology and previously worked in television and radio. He had his own television uh, talk show. And while contemporary politics do not really define the topics of his novels, um, he certainly does not shy away from uh, comments on current issues, especially in his weekly column in Yediot Achonot, uh, the leading um, or the most uh, read, I would say, Israeli daily newspaper. What defines Meir Shalev as a world-renowned writer, though, um, whose book has been, have been translated into over 25 languages and have been bestsellers in not only Israel, but also Germany, Holland, and other places, is, of course, the universal universality of his topics. Topics like love and death and peace and war are not bound to readers of one religion or ethnicity, even if they are embedded in a certain location and within a certain tradition of writing. <coughs> That's why he has been named the Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts et des Lettres by the French government. And among his many honors are the National Jewish Book Award, the Bernstein Prize, and smiling a little bit, the Brenner Price as well, <laughs> nothing to do with me. Um, Israel's uh, one of Israel's really top um, literary awards. Like other renowned Israeli authors, um, Meir Shalev is also known for his children's books, and I really need to say this because um, I have to admit that uh, one of my and my daughter's, especially all-time favorites, is Abba Sebushot which I think is translated as my father embarrasses me into English. Um, and uh, I remember many, many, many readings of this book with my daughter. His most recent books include a family memoir, My Russian Grandmother and Her American Vacuum Cleaner, a book of essays about the Bible called Beginnings, Reflections on the Bible's Intriguing Firsts. If you're curious, you can buy all these books outside an unconventional literary novel, Two She-Bears, and in 2017, his latest book, My Wild Garden, which is not like any other book I have read. On the surface, it is about his garden in the Yezreel Valley, where he has nourished wild trees and plants. But between the lines, it is really much more about the attempt to establish some kind of normality, I would say, in a region characterized not always by normality, but by a lot of strife and conflict and stress. So um, I think that is a very special book. And he will talk to us tonight about a topic that um, I think um, has its own interest, no matter who we'll talk about, but especially one of the foremost Israeli writers. And the topic is, can the Hebrew language survive, survive its own Revival. So please uh, join me in welcoming um, Mayor Shalev tonight. Thank you and good evening and, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I, I will talk about the, some special aspects uh, of, of the Hebrew language, which is a, spe a very special uh, language, but uh, 
as uh, you hear, I have to speak about the Hebrew language and the English language, and, and this is a, a kind of a problem. I'm, I'm going to c commit some uh, grammatical crimes uh, uh, along this uh, lecture, but uh, I, I, I want to tell you something about the Hebrew and the, and the English. It's a story that my father told me. My father was a, a great uh, Bible teacher and, and scholar, he was a secular uh, uh, person, but he was one of the most knowledgeable uh, people in Israel uh, about the Bible. Um, and in the time of the of, uh, Second World War, he volunteered uh, uh, to the British Army, served in a very unheroic uh, uh, job. He was escorting um, uh, caravans of, of ammunition from the port of Haifa to Alexandria in, in there were uh, caravans of trucks. And he was one of the soldiers that were uh, uh, sitting uh, next to the driver with a rifle and uh, 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 going for a journey of about 10 days. Um, and along the way, he, he, was, he and the driver were talking. The driver was an older English person, a Christian, uh, a, a pious uh, a Christian man, and he, he knew a lot about the, the Old Testament, not only the New Testament. And he found a, a good uh, uh, a friend for, for, for conversation uh, in my father. They had a long talks about the biblical characters and, and stories. And in the end of this journey, uh, uh, this driver uh, uh, came to my father and, and hugged him. And he said, thank you for, for this uh, experience of talking to me about the Bible and, and uh, with a Jewish person. And let me tell you, it had never occurred to me they translated this book into Hebrew as well. <laughs> and, and, uh, so, so, and, and, and uh, it, it is a true story, so I, I, I tell it as a compensation uh, for, my, for, my, for my English, uh, which uh, was never translated to, to, to Hebrew uh, yet. Um, I, I want to, to give you an example of the uh, strangeness and, and, the, and, and, and the uniqueness of, of this language from a, uh, something that I, I uh, experienced. Uh, when I was uh, younger, I used to, to ride uh, a motorcycle uh, in Israel, and, and this was my vehicle. One day, I drove uh, all the way from Jerusalem to the Galilee, but through the valley of the Jordan, uh, from the Dead, Dead Sea to the Lake of Galilee. And on the way, I saw three other motorcyclists uh, um, at the side of the road trying to repair something in, in one of the uh, motorcycles. And you know that motorcyclists, at least in Israel, uh, try to, to help each other. We are harassed by everybody, so we helped each, each other. So I stopped, and I took off my helmet. And I said, do you need some kind of help? I said, I'm not a mechanic, but if you need anything that I can do, I will help you. And one of them looked at me, and uh, immediately I saw that he, he recognized me uh, because years ago I used to work for the television. And he said, yes, I have something I want you to help me with. And he went to the bag of his uh, motorcycle and took out a copy of my book, uh, Isau. <laughs> and he went through the pages, and he said, what is the meaning of this word? <laughs> now, the word was... Bulmos. Bulmos is means uh, um, in in uh, in Hebrew. It's a Greek word that uh, was absorbed by by the Hebrew language, like many other foreign words that were uh, 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 used used in the Hebrew language. Even the names of the months that we call Hebrew months are Babylonian and and uh, uh, Assyrian. Uh, so, bulmos means a, a great appetite, uh, 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 eating a lot. Uh, bolemia, the, 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 the service of, of bolemia comes from the same word. And we took this word and, and we use it. And uh, 
and and uh, and I explained to him what 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 is the meaning of the word. And 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 this is uh, uh, and the end of the story is that a few years later I started to see in the papers mainly the local papers who are more adaptive to Israeli Hebrew slang. We started to see the word boles. Uh, in the Hebrew language. Now, boles means, in the Hebrew slang, uh, uh, eating uh, uh, in a gargantuan uh, way. Again, eating, eating uh, a lot. But it is also a biblical word that has to do with agriculture. The prophet uh, Amos, Amos was a, a shepherd of cows. Thank you. Was a, a shepherd of cows, and he was... Boles Shikmin. Shikma is the sycamore tree, so he was bolesing uh, this, uh, this tree. Nobody knows what does it mean. <laughs> it's some kind of an agricultural procedure that we don't know what it is. There is a theory that if you uh, 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 put a needle through the fruits of the ficus family, you enhance the ripening of, of the fruit. There is such a wasp in nature that does it for the uh, for the fruit. So maybe Boles Shikmim is, is a farmer who does it to the fruit with a needle, but it's only an assumption. Nobody knows what it is. On the other hand, it is a nice word, which is going was going to die very soon because it has no use in our life today. But it got a new life by becoming a word for, for, uh, for eating, uh, because boles sounds like bolea, which is swallow, and loes, which is chewing. This mixture of these two verbs in Hebrew uh, it, it made it possible for the uh, uh, disappearing word boles to come to life again. And it is also like bulmos, the Greek word that uh, Many Israelis, not, not uh, ignorant uh, 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 motorcyclists, uh, know. <laughs> so this is an example of, of a language that still has co such connections with its old roots that even the slang <coughs> of this language will use these words. Not only the slang, uh, there are other words in, in the Bible uh, that nobody knows their meaning. And they were all also doomed for extinction, but, but they were revived in the uh, revolution of the Hebrew language, I, I will talk later. One of them is ekdach. Ekdach today is the Hebrew word for a, a, a revolver or a pistol. We don't have a, a, the difference like in, in English, but ekdach is for the, this kind of a R. Uh, it is mentioned in the Bible as a kind, maybe a kind of a stone, but not sure. The root of this word is, is a kadoach, which is something that has to do with heat. The word uh, kadachat in Hebrew, which means fever, is also from the same, the same root. Now, this, this word was in the Bible. Nobody knew what it was. And then Eliezer ben Yehuda himself, the, the reviver or the... the uh, the man who, 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 this is the man who kissed the sleeping beauty called the Hebrew language, uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, decided to, to adopt it and give it a new meaning. What happened was that the, the, he wanted Egdach to be the name of a rifle, not of a, a, a pistol. But the public, the people, the users, who are the, the last uh, people who decide the fate of every word, used, this, used it for, for a, a pistol. Ben Yehuda was very angry about it, but no use. It, it's the, the, the voice of the multitude of, of the people is, is what counts. Same thing happened with the word chashmal. Chashmal is a word from the book of uh, Ezekiel. Uh, again, nobody knows what it is. Chashmal uh, 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 today in Hebrew is electricity. Now, nobody knew what electricity is at the times of the prophet Ezekiel. <laughs> he surely did not mean that. And he wanted Chashmal to be the Hebrew word for a telegraph. 
because mal is like mila, a word, and chash is like chish, which is quick. So he thought it's a good word for, for telegraph. Again, the people didn't want to use it for telegraph, and they used it for electricity. But you see how these old words, meaningless words, uh, who would have died otherwise, became modern, used words in our uh, 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 modern language. In order to, to, to give you a, a, an example uh, or an idea of, of uh, modern Hebrew, I would say that the main, the main problem today of, of the Hebrew language is the pace of changes that uh, take place in, in its uh, development. Uh, every language develops and changes along the years, but things that in other languages will take uh, 200 or 500 years take uh, 20 or 30 years uh, in the Hebrew language. This is because it was not used for 2,000 years. It was used only in synagogue, in religious ceremonies, it did not develop because Jews did not use it in their daily life, so they didn't need to, to develop it and update it. And, and uh, uh, it, it was, again, it was not dead. It was some kind of a coma or, or a sleep. Uh, um, it's interesting that uh, we have uh, uh, um, letters of rabbis from different places, like, let's say, if a rabbi from Poland wanted to correspond with a rabbi in uh, France or uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Yemen, they will both use the Hebrew language, the biblical language they knew uh, from the, the Talmud and the Bible, because this was the only common language they could understand together. But yet it was not used uh, in daily life. People used the local language of the country where they lived, or jargons like Yiddish and Ladino, uh, uh, for, for their own uh, uh, daily life. One of the examples, uh, 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 manifestations of this, of this uh, uh, um, uh, problem today is that we have uh, uh, books that are translated to Hebrew from other languages, and if they are popular enough, they are translated again and again and again every 20 or 30 years because the next generation of children finds it difficult to read. For example, Tom Sawyer was translated to Hebrew five times already, or, or four. Uh, three men in a boat, not to mention The Dog by Jerome K. Jerome, the classical English book, was translated five times. I have the first tran translation at home. It's from 1921. He did not have a word for tomato yet in Hebrew. In the biblical time, we did not have tomatoes in, in, in the Middle East, uh, not in Europe. It, it came to the old world only in the uh, 15th uh, century from, from America after Columbus. So um, the translator to Hebrew uh, uh, took the word tomatoes, and he gave it the plural form of Hebrew, tomatim, and this was uh, tomatoes. Uh, today it is agvaniot. <laughs> agvania is a very nice word because agvania is a kind of a root uh, word. Uh, the root uh, agov, la agov, means to flirt in a very erotic uh, manner. Is a, uh, I, I don't think today this word would, would, would pass the public opinion. <laughs> and it was problematic even when it was created. Uh, um, and, and, uh, but today, everybody says in the, in the uh, grocery shop or in the supermarket, we say agvania very naturally. But the word, the word agvania originally means a, a, a woman who is, uh, I would say, um, uh, not very polite when she wants a man. Something like that, Agvania. She is ogevet on, on this man. Um, in the Bible, we have this word, the uh, Shir Agavim, for example, is, is, a, is a erotic uh, uh, poetry. And today we, we buy it. Uh, we, nobody thinks about uh, this original uh, uh, meaning 
uh, anymore. Um, uh, other books that were tr translated, um, Lolita, My Antonia, The Dubliners, Crime and Punishment, Anna Karenina, Master and Margarita, each of them were, was translated twice. These are not uh, children books, as you know. Uh, uh, but Moby Dick was translated three times to Hebrew. It is interesting because in the first translation, it is not a whale, Leviathan in, in Hebrew, it is tanin, which today we use for an alligator or a crocodile. But the word tanin in the, in the Bible is some kind of a sea monster. We don't know exactly which one, uh, we don't even know if it is a true creature. But the first translator to, of Moby Dick to Hebrew, uh, uh, Bortniker, uh, used the word tanin, and, uh, and the, the, the profession of a whaling was tananut, which he invented. There is, there is no such a word uh, in, in Hebrew. And it gives the book a very special atmosphere, these, uh, these, the, these words, and especially in the chapter where Melville analyzes the story of Jonah and the great fish which is wrongly translated in many cases to English as a whale, because the Bible doesn't say a whale, it says a big fish, Dag Gadot, uh, which is interesting, as if they knew already that a whale cannot swallow a person. It takes a very uh, a, a, a creature with a, a big uh, 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 throat. Uh, so these are the example of the changes in, in the, in the uh, uh, Hebrew language uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, force the people, if there is a demand for Tom Sawyer again and again, one generation after the other, there is also uh, 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 this uh, um, uh, need for, for new translation. The, the link of the Hebrew language to, to, the, to the biblical language is, is you can also see it in, in books that were written in Hebrew. For example, uh, in, in two, three generations ago, ago the, the knowledge of the people of the biblical text was much broader and deeper than the, the knowledge of people today. Uh, and when uh, Nahum Gutman, one of our great uh, illustrators and, and, and artists and, and children book uh, uh, writer, wrote his memoir about the first days of Tel Aviv, he described the day the first musician came to Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv was 20 houses in the dunes, north, uh, uh, west, northeast to, to Tel Aviv, uh, half a mile away. And they saw one day, they saw this man crossing the dunes uh, heavily, carrying a violin uh, uh, bag. And they were very happy because they did not have any music in, 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 in town. And they asked him, how did you come here? What brought you here? And he said, I feel as if a big fish vomited me to this <laughs> beach. Gutman knew that everybody knows the story of Jonah. And this metaphor will, will really says, he doesn't want to mock at them, what he really says is, God sent me to you. Because this is how Jonah eventually came to Nineveh, where he has to, to tell his prophecy. So when he says that a, big, a big fish brought me here, it means I was sent by God. God gave you this gift of my music, and there is the, the first concert took place the same night on one of the sand dunes uh, uh, of Tel Aviv. When, when Bialik, our national poet, wrote one of his most beautiful poems, the ones that were not taught in high school, uh, in high school they taught us only the poems of Bialik that will make sure that no, no one of us will want to read Bialik again after <laughs> school is over. The most heavy, boring, national historical uh, uh, poetry of, of Bialik, like Metei uh, Midbar and Be'ir Ariga, and while they were reading this, I was going to uh, 
you are holechet at me, me, you are leaving me, a very sad uh, romantic song, or uh, the sea of stillness, uh, uh, Polet, how, how would you say, Polet Sodot, uh, utters, maybe utters secrets, Yamad Mama Polet Sodot, and the hungry eyes, which is one of the few erotic poems by Bialik. העיניים הרעבות האלה שככה תטבענה, השפתיים הצמאות האלה שואלות נשקנו, העופרים האורגים האלה הקוראים תופסנו. In English, my, my translation, free translation, those hungry eyes who are so demanding, those thirty lips who ask, kiss us, those yearning or longing Fawns uh, who say, who utter, catch, touch us, grab us. I don't know, I don't say grab since Trump started to ex <laughs> ex express himself. But, but he says, Now, the eyes and the lips are the words themselves. Uh, these are the, the eyes and the lips. These are the words for eyes and, and lips, enaim and sfataim. But when he came to the breasts of his beloved woman, he did not want to use, to use the word breasts. He wanted something more polite, more poetic. So he used fawns, the, 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 the children of, of the deer. <coughs> because in the Song of Songs in the Bible, it is says, Shnei Shadaich of Kishnei Ofarei Tzviya. Your breasts, in the Bible it says, are like two identical fawns of, of the deer. And this is known to every Bible reader and to every Hebrew speaker. Today, if you read this song, very, very few readers will understand what, what does he mean. Uh, but when he wrote this poem, he, he, could, he, he was sure that every reader will understand uh, uh, the meaning of, of uh, 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 what, 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 what he is writing here. Um, um, in, in, when I give a title to, uh, titles to my book, sometimes I use a biblical phrase. For example, uh, a book of mine which is, was translated to Hebrew as uh, both uh, to, to English, I'm sorry, to English as uh, four meals. The, the original title is As a Few Days, Keyamim Achadim. Now, Keyamim Achadim is, 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 from, is, is a, cup, a couple of words from, I think, the most beautiful verse in the Bible. It says, Vayavod Yaakov Berachel Sheva Shanim. And Jacob was working for Rachel for seven years, and they seemed to him as a few days because of his love to her. This is a, a, a novel. What, what I just said is a novel, a very short novel, but, but it's, 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 it's a beautiful literary body uh, 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 story. And I, I decided to, to, to title my book Keyamim Achadim as a few days because the, the lover in my book is very patient. He can wait for years for his love to come true. And I wanted to give this biblical atmosphere of Jacob. I even gave him the name Jacob as well to, to establish this, uh, this trade. And I came to my publisher and I said, and this is the title of the new book. He said, this is a horri horrible title. <laughs> And he said, where did you find it? <laughs> this, it? It was not the editor. It was the, the director of the publishing house, the, man, the executive director. My editor loved it, loved it because he recognized it immediately. And he said, no one will be able to buy this book in the shop because nobody will come to the shop and say, give me the book, Keyami Mahadi. Maybe you remove the calf and it will be yamim achadim, few days. I said, but if I remove the calf, the association, the, the, the connection to the biblical story will disappear. Nobody will recognize it. And he said, and how many will recognize it with the calf? You know? <laughs> I said, 20 people, and they deserve such a time. <laughs> it's, a, 
And till to, he was right. Till today, when people talk to me about this, this book, they can never, they never say the, the, the real name, Kiyamim Achadim. They say, Yamim Achadim, Hayu Yamim, <laughs> Tho, those were the days, Miyamim Yamima, all kinds of inventions, but not, not uh, uh, my, my last novel, Two She Bears, luckily the American publisher kept the original uh, title, Stein Du Beam. Is there, this is by the way, a, a very, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a couple of words that, that I like a lot because it shows that even in biblical times they made mistakes in Hebrew. <laughs> it's not a phenomenon of our times. Stein Dubim is like Eser Shekel, is, is, a, is, is a, using the wrong uh, gender. You know that in Hebrew, every word has a gender. Uh, a, a, a chair, for example, is, is masculine, but an armchair is feminine in Hebrew. Why, we don't know, but this is, this is how it is. I remember my grandmother, uh, uh, the, the, the lady with the vacuum cleaner from, from my book, she, whenever, whenever somebody was di died in the village or in the family, she said uh, uh, in her rich but uh, wrong Hebrew, she would say, Hu nena. <laughs> he is not anymore, but the he is masculine and, and, and does not exist, she said, in the feminine. And then she said, <laughs> Always, be, be, and she said, Mavet Ayuma. Now, Mavet is death. He has a horrible death. Had a horrible death. Now, uh, death in Hebrew is masculine. I, I, horrible Ayuma is, is, is feminine. I said, why don't you say Mavet Ayom? She said, because Mavet is, is, is feminine. And now she took it from the Russian, her native language. In Russian, Mavet is feminine. This is interesting, something that deserves a res re research. Why is it that in one language, death is, is a man, and in another language, it is a woman? But this is a, a different issue. But so I used uh, uh, Stein du Beam, two shebers, because uh, it comes from the very cruel biblical story about the prophet Elisha. Uh, uh, that uh, was walking near a, a, a town and some kids came out of town, saw him, and uh, said something like, uh, Aleke reach, Aleke reach, which means go on or, or, or go up, a uh, uh, bold person. And you know some people, even prophets, cannot really cope with uh, losing their hair, and Elisha, <laughs> Elisha was one of them. And they did not have, I guess, wigs at that time or, or all these uh, special ways of combing your hair. Or, or. And he was a bold person, so he got so insulted and furious that uh, he cursed them, and the Bible said, in the name of God. And since he was a prophet, he had good connections with God. <laughs> Two she-bears, Stein Dubim, came out from the forest, and they killed 42 children which is, of course, a, a most terrible uh, story. And, and I, I wanted to remind this, this story to the, to, re to the reader of my book because there is some kind of brutality in my book that not compares to the killing of, of 42 children, but getting quite closer uh, to that. And this was my, may of, of my, my way uh, uh, of doing it. From the same story, there is today a, 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 an idiom that many use, even without knowing it comes from the Bible. We say, lo dubim velo ya, which means no bears and no forest, which means the thing you are telling me never happened. I don't believe you. Or, or if I uh, accuse you uh, with something, you say, lo dubim velo ya, which means it never existed, it never happened which is part of the traditional uh, interpretation of the Bible that tries to remove this uh, guilt from Elisha for what, uh, uh, about what he did to these uh, 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 poor children. Uh, today we use in modern Hebrew uh, expressions 
that are taken from the Bible and very few people recognizes the origin of it. I think this is a proof of the success of these idioms. If they are still used without knowing the, 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 the original meaning or the original source, it means they are rooted very deep into the, in the language. They will never uh, 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 be taken away from the language like chashmal uh, or uh, egdach could uh, uh, perish from the language. One of them is milchemet chorma, which means the war of chorma. Uh, this expression uh, means a war with no prisoners, a war that, where everybody is killed, the enemy is, is, is uh, 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 annihilated. Milchemet uh, Chorma, uh, the word Chorma is a name of a place in the Bible, a city, in the, a town in the Bible where such a war took place. Um, I, I think that the, 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 the greatest achievement of a biblical uh, idiom is being uh, uh, used in the sports supplement of Yediot Haronot uh, <laughs> in Israel. Because this is sort of a very uh, popular language that everybody will understand. The, the avid readers of the sports uh, uh, supplement, which is mainly f uh, soccer in Israel, uh, will not understand very high language. So, uh, and still they use the expression milchemet chorma, and I think this is a proof of, of the success. But we also say, for example, uh, emek hashave, higiu le emek hashave. They came to the valley of shave. This is the 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 the, the verse from the Bible. Shave was the name of a person, but shave today means equal. So higiu le emek hashave in the Bible. It, it, they came to the valley that belonged to a person called Shave. But today it means they came to a, an agreement. They are leveled. They are equal uh, to each other. People use it all the time, and people uh, uh, do not even know it, it, uh, it, is, uh, uh, it came from, from the Bible. Now, I want to go back to the, to the times of the, the, the revival of the language. This was one of the objecti of objectives uh, 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 of Zionism, was the revival of the Hebrew language as a language that will unite all the Jewish people in the, Jewish, in the state of the Jewish people who will eventually be, be established. I think till today, the, the two great achievements of Zionism uh, are the establishment of the state of Israel and the revival of the Hebrew language. Many other uh, um, I uh, Zionist ideas were not achieved or were achieved and then neglected. But the, the, uh, creating a new state, in a way, it's even easier than, than reviving a language. This is an achievement with, with no equal. No, it never happened anywhere else. You know that in the 50s, uh, there was a delegation from Spain of Basque people who came to learn how we did it because they want to revive this, the Basque language. They have it. It is written. They, they write. They, they, uh, uh, they translate to, to the Basque language. It's a very strange language with no similarity to any other language. Uh, by the way, there was a beautiful edition of uh, the journeys of Benjamin of Tudela, Masot bin Yamin mi Tudela, a great Jewish, Spanish Jew uh, traveler uh, who wrote a diary of his travels uh, in, in, in Spanish, in Hebrew, and in Basque language, because Tudela belonged to the Basques at the time of uh, bin Yamin uh, uh, mi Tudela. And, uh, and uh, they came to us, tried to learn how to do it, and, and they failed. I mean, uh, it was, uh, uh, um, uh, I would say, groups of fanatics who sometimes even used a certain amount of violence. And, and they managed to, uh, I will, uh, this, this fanaticism was also manifested in Ben Yehuda's family as well, when he had a son. 
he did not uh, let him listen to any other language but only Hebrew in his home, which disconnected him from, from other children and from, from neighbors and from other people. And he, this is Itamar Ben Avi, who knew the, uh, was the first, he uh, was called the first Jewish kid, not Jewish, but he, they said Ivri, the first Hebrew uh, child who, who, who spoke Hebrew. And, and, and this is some kind of a cruelty to, to, to the little boy, but this is what Ben Yehuda himself did to his, uh, to, to his own child. And uh, they started to, to uh, uh, talk uh, and use Hebrew and Hebrew only in schools. They were uh, um, demonstrating uh, against people who still use the, uh, uh, the uh, foreign languages, especially German. Um, they were against uh, using the German language in the Technion, uh, uh, our technical uh, um, uh, uh, high school. Um, they were against any infiltration of a foreign word into Hebrew. What they did was uh, uh, first inventing many new words. The Hebrew did not have a word for a car. The Hebrew did not have a word for electricity. The Hebrew did not have a, 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 a word for many um, uh, um, uh, uh, medicines, for example. Um, I always uh, say that uh, when, when I meet uh, uh, people in, in other countries and I want to tell them about the language I'm using when writing my books, I, I, I tell them, and, and uh, especially in, in, in Catholic countries, it, it, it is sometimes it's shocking to the listeners, I said, if, if King David and Jesus Christ will come into this room, I will be able to talk to them and they will be able to talk to me. And then I tell them, we will not be able to talk about the new model of uh, Ferrari, for example, and we will not be able to argue uh, uh, about uh, uh, IBM versus uh, Macintosh, but we will be able to talk about love and about longing and about memory and about revenge uh, and about uh, parents and children, and this is literature. These topics are literature. So we will be able to talk about books. I will be able to ask King David if he really wrote the book of Psal Psalms, as they say, and if so, uh, I, I would love to tell him how much I, I like chapter 104, for example, which I really love. It's a, it's a book about uh, the way God uh, runs the, the, the natural world, the animals, uh, the plants, uh, the sea, the sun, how he runs them in a very ecological, uh, uh, modern way. Now, when, when they uh, uh, use these uh, uh, new words, they either took words, like I said before, from the Bible that had no, no new meaning, but they also uh, took some f foreign, uh, 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 foreign words and gave them a Hebrew form. For example, the word for brush in Hebrew is mivreshet. Is they took the same uh, consonants of brush uh, 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 from the English, and they put it in a Hebrew feminine form uh, 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 of, of, uh, of, of, um, of, uh, of an object, of a noun, uh, uh, in the Hebrew language. When we speak about the, the dangers uh, that, uh, that maybe uh, threatens the, the modern day uh, Hebrew, there are two of them. One of them is that Hebrew and the state of Israel go together. And if something happened to the state of Israel and it will be destroyed, God forbid, in any way, or it will be emptied from her Jewish people, the Hebrew language will again retreat to the glass box and fall asleep again. Because uh, it is in daily use only in Israel. 
Uh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm in my lectures in the United States. I meet a lot of Israelis who live in America. Uh, I, I talk to them and they ask me questions about uh, what do I think about what they did, what do I think about their uh, future, what do I think about their culture, their identity. I said it's not really what I think, I think it's what they are doing about it, but, but uh, as for the language, I, I tell them that uh, even if they, they will be successful to keep the Hebrew language alive in the mouths of their sons and daughters, it will disappear in the days of their, of their grandchildren. No doubt about it, because the ch their own children speak Hebrew, uh, uh, um, understand Hebrew, they hardly read Hebrew. I was once uh, approached by a lady, approached by an Israeli lady uh, in, uh, in uh, the University of Rutgers, there was a lecture I gave to Israelis only. And, and this woman was very angry at me because I was talking uh, very friendly about the Hebrew slang. I like uh, uh, the Hebrew slang. And she, she, then she stood up and she said, I can't stand what you do, not me, but you, the Israelis, are doing to the Hebrew language. I come to visit Israel once a year and there are words I hear in the street I cannot understand anymore. <laughs> People say, the young, the young generation, they say, Chaval al azman, Ptsatsot la gabot. I don't understand what they are talking about. And then I got sort of angry, and I said, my dear lady, we have another expression in Hebrew which she understood because it is an old expression. I said, Bizman sha'at yoshevet ala tachat, <laughs> which means while you are sitting on your bottom doing nothing, we are improving and enriching our language. <laughs> and if you want to be part of it and understand it, you have to come more often to Israel or ask your relatives in Israel to send you these uh, innovations. The other danger, which is more, I think, uh, um, uh, possible than the destruction of Israel, because this is the fate of every classical language, is that Hebrew eventually will be divided like Arabic and Greek and Latin uh, to classical language and modern language. And eventually, uh, we will not be able, for example, to, to read all texts and understand them. I don't think there are many Greek people who can read the Iliad and the Odyssey as Homer wrote them. And I don't think there is anybody except the University of Rome, but, but the people in the street can read the uh, Metamorphosis by, by Ovidius uh, and understand it. Uh, we can still read the Bible and understand part of it. Our children less. And I think that eventually we will have to translate the Bible to modern Hebrew. <laughs> and this time it is not a, a funny story. It, it will have to happen. And we will have a Bible. By the way, it was done already, but the translation was very poor. We will have the Bible with the original text on, on one side and, the, and the, a modern Hebrew on the other side, so people will be able to, to understand it. Otherwise, people will stop reading it. But um, I read my grandchildren. I have a, 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 grandchild, a grandson of uh, four and a granddaughter of, uh, of uh, nine. And I read them the Bible stories. And what we do is that uh, we, 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 my father did it to me when I, when I was young. And, and I think it's a, it's, it's a good habit. And I read it to them from the Bible. And I give immediately a, a consecutive tr translation to modern Hebrew. And I ask them about the different words. Do you understand this word? Because they don't ask, as if they understand. So we were, we were reading the story of Samson. And my granddaughter, who is older and heard this story before, whispered in my ear, she wants to protect her little brother, said, don't, don't read about 
the eyes of Samson because uh, the, the, the Philistines took out his, his eyes. So he said, don't, don't read him this part. And I read him the, this uh, 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 verse about uh, Shimshon, Samson, meeting the lion in, in, the, in the field, in the, in the, in the vineyard. And, and, uh, and it is says that Shimshon uh, It's a little kind of a pun in, in Hebrew. Leshasea in Hebrew is to tear apart, literally, to tear apart. This is what Samson did to the lion without uh, any weapon, with his bare hands. And I say, do you understand what is Vayeshasehu? Nobody talks like this today. Nobody uses this verb anymore. He says, no. What do you understand? He understand that Samson killed the lion. OK, that's good enough. And then we, we come to the end of the story. After the, uh, Delilah shaved the head of Samson, and he lost all his powers, and the Philistines took him to, to prison. And then the Bible says, Vayachel sar rosho letzameach kasher gulach. And Samson's hair started to grow after he was shaved. Now, this word, this sentence, has syntax different from modern Hebrew. Instead of hitchil began, it says vayachel. It's the same root, but very different. It says sar instead of hasear shel, the hair of. And kasher gulach, it's strange. I said, I stopped and I, I asked him, do you understand what is going to happen? And he said, yes, he will be strong again. <laughs> because he understood the, 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 the linguistic atmosphere, the language atmosphere of, of the sentence. And this is very nice. Th these are the things that really move me because uh, as if there is something in, in the linguistic genes of, of him and the Hebrew language that enable him to understand a sentence that, that he doesn't hear in kindergarten or, or in, in his family or, or in the street. Sometimes we have uh, expressions uh, that are used by, by people. In, uh, again, I will refer to the... To the uh, example of the uh, uh, the fans of uh, football of soccer in, in Israel. Whenever there is a, a goal uh, uh, in in such a game, the fans from the around the the, the field shout Yes Elohim, <laughs> which means there is God. <laughs> now, th 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 this came from Achen Yes Elohim b'makom azeh ve'ani lo yadati from the Bible. There is God in this place, and I didn't know it before. Yes, Elohim, I think, is another place. And, and, and every time I hear it in the sports uh, on television, it's really great that, that, that uh, it, is kept, it, it is kept. And if we go back to, to Samson's, uh, 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 what is my, my pardon? OK. So no, you said. Uh, a certain uh, uh, um, uh, so after Samson killed the lion, um, he went away. The corpse of the lion stayed there on the ground. And a few months later, he went there to see what, what happened to the corpse. And there were wild bees built a hive inside the skeleton of the lion. And Samson uh, uh, took the honey with his hands, which I think you need more uh, bravery to do that than killing the lion with the same hand. <laughs> and he took the, the, the honey, and, and he, he was walking, uh, walking and eating, it is said. And then he had this riddle, this puzzle that he gave to the Philistines in, uh, to test them. And he said, uh, please uh, solve this, uh, this puzzle. Me ha'ochel yatsa ma'achal, u me'az yatsa matok. 
from the from the predator from the eater came out food and from the, the strong meaz uh, came out something sweet and they couldn't and then his wife uh, told him uh, told him told them the the solution till today we say meaz yatsama tok or meaz yetsema tok in the future uh, uh, tense when we want to say that even from a tragedy something good may evolve, may happen. If there was an accident, or if you were fired, or if uh, a sickness or whatever, sometimes we hope for that, that me'az yetzema tok, that from this uh, uh, strength of the lion, something sweet and nice uh, will come out. There are many people in, in Israel who think that the great danger of, of uh, uh, that, that uh, is there waiting for, for, for our dear Hebrew, is the use of, of uh, foreign words, the use of English words, Arabic words, Russian words, Yiddish words, which is true. We use, I told, as I told you before, even, even the, the, the names of the months are, 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 are foreign, but they infiltrated into the language in, in, the, in the biblical time, so we don't see them as foreign words anymore. Uh, my father was one of these people who, he liked Hebrew slang very much. I remember when I was in the army, he asked me a lot of times, what, what are the new words in the army? Because in, in, in Tzahal, in the IDF, many of the Hebrew slang words are created because uh, these are a lot of young people together. They are not very political, uh, politically correct. They are, uh, uh, they have their own kind of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of uh, activity. For example, I was once uh, 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 48 hours in, in a submarine of uh, the Israeli Navy. And, and uh, we were going underwater and I was, I, I was listening to the slang. I said, the slang is usually created in small closed societies. What is smaller and close, closer than a submarine? They must have their own, their own language. So I asked them about their slang, and they said that the, the people who, have, uh, who are seasick, uh, they call lions. I said, how come? I mean, I thought you will, be some, you will mock at them, you will make fun of them. They said, we call them lions because they roar in the bucket. <laughs> Because in the submarine, you cannot go up to the deck and throw up into the sea. You are in the submarine. So you take a bucket, and the sound, sorry for that, the sound of vomiting in the bucket is, is like a roar. So they call them lions. And, and this is something which is used only in a submarine. It is not used in, in, in the ships, uh, that, that in the ship that uh, is going on the surface uh, uh, of the sea. There is also slang of a family. In my family, there is a lot of expressions that are unique uh, to this, uh, to, to, to our family. If I have time, I will tell you about it later. And we also have a lot of uh, for, foreign words, like uh, uh, a, a sandal came both to English and to Hebrew from the Greek. Melophephon, uh, um, which is cucumber in Hebrew, is also Greek. Uh, we cares almost only in Arabic. It's a little Russian, uh, but we cares in Arabic because um, uh, also, also the, the names of uh, certain body parts we use in, in Arabic, not in Hebrew, as if we want to keep our language clean. <laughs> so we, we, we cares in, 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 in Arabic, a little Yiddish. Um, we say, for example, or, or, or I, I said about Russian, so I remembered something that has nothing to do with, with what I'm talking about now, but I will forget otherwise. I was in a bus going to Tel Aviv, and there was a man sitting uh, in front of me with a cell phone in his hand. He was a, a Russian immigrant, I could tell by, by, by the accent, and he, all he said, he was sitting like this, and he said, do, do which means yes in, in Russian, da, da, sababa. <laughs> now, sababa is Arabic, 
and we use it as you use great. This is Sababa. And the, the natural way he used his native language, da, 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 Sababa. <laughs> this was, I, I was very happy about it because my father would say he should use Hebrew all along. Not, not yet, he should say, Ken, 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 Tov Meod, something like this. But then, by the way, I remember the day my father, one day he said, when we left, uh, when I, I, le I was visiting, and then I said, okay, I'm going home. And he said, instead of shalom or lehitaot, shalom or see you, he said, suddenly, bye. <laughs> As in English, and I felt the house, our, our house is collapsing <laughs> uh, around me. Because when I was a child, they never allowed me to use an, Eng an English word. Uh, there was something against the English word, be first because of the British mandat, mandat uh, times. They were the rulers of uh, Palestine uh, at that time. And also because we were part of the, of the language revolution. And we could not uh, contaminate our language again with, with these foreign words. I, I remember as a child in uh, Nahalal, um, there was a, a, a couple of singers called the, the, the Dudaim. Dudaim, how, how, how do you say? It's from, from the Bible. Um, I will remember, I know, I know the name. Is, is this a fruit that... Uh, that uh, Reuben, the son of Jacob, gave to his mother to, to make her more fertile. Mandrake. Uh, mandrake. mandrake. So the, this, this, these singers were called the Mandrakes. And, and uh, they were singing Hebrew songs, very nice, and f Israeli folk songs. And then in the end, they, they sang uh, Kisses Sweeter Than Wine of the Weavers, the, the old American uh, 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 band, and they sang it in English, and it took only one line that the two old pioneers of the village rose up and, and stopped the show, <laughs> started to scream. Not in our village, they said. Not, no English in our village. This was the, the reaction here, only Hebrew. My grandfather and my grandmother, when they came to to, to the to is to, to Palestine uh, uh, um, in 1907, in the second Aliyah, immediately stopped to talk Yiddish. This was their language at home, but they stopped to talk Yiddish. They talk only Hebrew, a little Russian here and there if they didn't want the children to understand. <laughs> my 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 mother and her sisters and brothers. Uh, and if somebody talked Yiddish to my grandfather, he would behave as if he did not hear. Yeah. He would just not react to, to what uh, uh, they told him. Today we say in Hebrew, we say uh, uh, never a dull moment, we say in Hebrew. We say take it or leave it. We say volume for the, the radio or the, the music. We say show off. We say check in. We have a Hebrew word biduk for check in, but we say check in. Uh, we say surprise <laughs> in, instead of surprise. We say surprise like this. <laughs> we translate from the from from the American to to Hebrew in an American way. We say for make sense. We say ose sechel, <laughs> which is makes a brain, something like this, which is very, very different from Hebrew syntax and Hebrew sound. Uh, we also say Ose Ahava because of make love. It doesn't exist in, in Hebrew. To, to, uh, uh, to make love, we don't have it, but we translated it uh, uh, literally. We, we say to, to take sugar and to take a shower in Hebrew because of, uh, we translated the, uh, uh, from, from uh, uh, the American. Look, I, I, I use less English, I would say, than, than my, my children uh, in my language, but I think this is, uh, it's, it's a natural phenomena that languages are taking words one, one from another. 
What I don't like is that I see a lot of uh, commercial signs in the street, names of shops or restaurants or, or malls, uh, uh, either in English words in Hebrew letters or English letters in English words, without any Hebrew. This, at the times of Eliezer ben Yehuda, a shop like this would, would be broken to pieces and even burnt. Uh, uh, this is what we try to tell the Basques to do, but they, I guess. Uh, but uh, uh, they did not. Um, uh, one of the, the issues today in, in modern Hebrew is the gender issue. As, as I told you before, each word in Hebrew is either masculine or feminine. Some words, very few, are both. Uh, uh, a knife, for example, is both feminine and, and masculine. Uh, sakin is, is a knife. It can be either chad or chada, which means sharp, but in the feminine and masculine, masculine form. Wind is, and sun is also uh, sun in the, in, in, in the sky. Uh, can be uh, feminine and, and, and masculine too. But uh, uh, today, slowly, not really slowly, this is the trouble, um, uh, we start to use only the feminine form of counting. Usually, uh, we have a, a, a slight difference between the feminine form of a number and, and the, the, uh, the masculine form of the same number. For example, Hamesh is five in the feminine, and chamisha is in the uh, masculine. Shesh and shisha, eser and asara. Uh, uh, today, people started to use only the, the feminine form. We say, many people say, even people my age, would say eser shekel, instead of asara shkalim, 10 shekels. Now, this is very painful. <laughs> when you hear it, you feel as if somebody scratched the glass with, uh, for me. And, but I know, I have to admit, that this is what's going to happen to the language. In 200 years or 100 years, everybody will say Esser Shekel, and it will be a good formal Hebrew. Because because the language is also an instrument. It's a machine. It, 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 it's an instrument of communication. And you don't have to invest, the, the, the language does not like to invest too much energy in order to be understood. And if you say Esser Shekel or Asarash Kalim, everybody understands both. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, I, I, I come, uh, I myself, uh, in an embarrassing situation. I'm also making mistakes in Hebrew here and there when I talk, because everybody makes mistakes uh, uh, in Hebrew. Uh, um, but uh, but I, at least I'm aware, I hear myself making the mistake. I, I'm aware of, aware of it. Um, now, uh, sometimes when I come to, to, to friends, to visit friends, they ask me if I want tea or coffee, as I said. Uh, tea, they, uh, then they say, you want the tea in a glass or in a mug, which in Hebrew it is bekos or besefer. This is, bekos is modern Hebrew. In the correct older Hebrew, it is bekos. I still say bekos, naturally, because I grew up at my father's house. But if I will say bechos to my friends, they will think I'm a lunatic, a, a weirdo, a weirdo, a, a, a tzodreiter in Yiddish. On the other side, I cannot say bechos. It, it hurts me. So I say besefel, and that's it. <laughs> Even though I like the glass. I say be, be, besefel. Otherwise, I, I will be really, really uh, uh, embarrassed. So, um, um, I will tell you uh, uh, about another expression of my family, and this will be the, uh, the, the end of, 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 of the lecture. One of the expressions in my family, which is mentioned uh, 
in, in my book, my, my American grandmother and her, no, my Russian grandmother and her American vacuum cleaner is the expression that we say in a very low voice, almost, almost whispering. We say, they tell she even manicures her hands, her nails. We, we use this expression in order to describe a person, doesn't matter whether a man or a woman, uh, a person who is really, has no values, and, uh, and, and is the, the, low, the lowest you can get uh, uh, is, they say he even manu she or he even manicures their hands. And it came from, from one day, I guess, before I, when I was born, the family was sitting around the table gossiping about other families in the, in the, in the village. And somebody said about someone who sold his uh, cucumbers directly to the shop in the city, not through the socialist uh, uh, cis economical system of the village. And everybody was uh, about that. And then they say, and his wife is even frolicking with the vet veterinarian of the next kibbutz. <laughs> and, and then, as if you step on a dead cockroach in the, in the mud, you said, and they say she even manicures her hands, <laughs> which means she is not one of us. She doesn't use her hands for building our state to be. Uh, she doesn't use these fingers to milk, to the cow, to hold the, uh, the shovel, uh, to harness the horse or, or uh, to, to, to uh, whatever, to, to collect the, the eggs. She's using them in order to be sexy and attractive and useless and no, not productive. This was the, it's not productive. So uh, uh, we use this expression and, ev and even today, and the funny thing is that the uh, um, young people of the family who, who, who belong to a generation where Everybody uh, 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 put luck, luck on, their thing, on their nails in the village and nobody cares about it. They still use this expression. <laughs> if you say about somebody who cheated his, uh, his, his friend or, 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 or stole something, he even manicures his hands. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much for listening to me. Can I take off my jacket? Okay. So a, just a second, I will put it on my chair. Yeah. Did you turn your thing off? Hello? We're going to have a short Q&A now. Um, and then Mayor will be signing books outside that you can also purchase. On the sweater here. Okay. Well, you know better. Now stay close. I don't know. Say Great. Thank you. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Can you all hear me? Good. Um, well, we could have listened another two hours, I think. It was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. So much. I. A lot of what you talked about was about transformation and changes of the language, and maybe growing up of a language even. And I wonder if you notice in your own writing now over several decades that your Hebrew has changed. I don't feel it in my novels, but I feel it in my children's books. Mm -hmm. my, my, yeah. first, uh, my first children's book uh, is, is written in a Hebrew which is, a, it was written 35 years ago. It's in a language which is very difficult for, for children uh, today. Uh, but then, I, my, 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 this was the first one, and even then I understood that I was, lose, use a language which yeah. is a little difficult. And, 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 but the rest of my, I, I can feel a slow, uh, 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 slow changes in, 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 my, in my language. 
Uh, but till today, I, I try to, to write for children in, in good, rich Hebrew. One day, my, uh, my editor uh, in the paper, not in the publishing house, uh, I gave him one of my children's books for his uh, grandchildren, and he said, you use three different words to uh, running away, which is nas and barach and nimlat. Why do you make the, the life difficult for the little readers of yours? You can use only one of them, which will be barach, is the most common uh, of the three. I said, because I want them to know the others as well, and, and they, they will ask their parents, and uh, if uh, the parents will not know the answer, you will have to look through the dictionary. And if he doesn't have a Hebrew dictionary at home, it means he doesn't read books anyway, so, <laughs> so it's not... Uh, <coughs> <laughs> yeah, but in, in my novels, I keep... Uh, look, there, there are people like this motorcyclist who did not understand the, the word bulmos. I don't blame, blame him for that, and I, I appreciate the fact that, that he asked me about it. But, uh, but um, and there are complaints about difficulty of, of the language, and sometimes when I give uh, interpretation of a certain paragraph, uh, in the university or in lecture to students. And I said, look, this is taken from the Bible in order to create some kind of an, mm. an analogy or uh, metaphorical uh, meaning. And they say, but we don't know it. I said, well, I, I cannot be responsible for, for every reader. It's, uh, yeah. Right. I mean, <clears throat> the other point, and then we'll open it up uh, in a minute, um, Hebrew, of course, change is also because many people don't, as you indicated, don't relate to the religious, to the meanings that people had once they still knew the Bible and other religious references. And I wonder how this, do you see something as um, maybe we call it the secularization of the Hebrew language? Something like a process like that. It, it's 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 not only the secularization. It also it it is not um, for us in Israel. It is not the holy language anymore. It's a daily language. Mm -hmm. We use it. Uh, I think one of the reasons uh, people preferred to speak Yiddish and Ladino or a local language like English or Arabic mm -hmm. uh, or, or or German is because religious people did not want to dirty the holy language with daily, mm -hmm. uh, daily uses. So uh, it, was, it was easy for them. But when, when the Zionism decided to make the revival of, of the language uh, uh, an, an objective, uh, it, it became daily. We wash the floor in, in, uh, in, in Hebrew. We make love in Hebrew. We buy in the shop in Hebrew. And we clean the toilet in Hebrew. So uh, it, it became a normal language. But still, we have these uh, old, uh, old associations, which, which, which I, li I, like, I like it a lot. There is, uh, sometimes you only say one word, and, and uh, a full world is, 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 is coming up uh, li like a flower uh, f from the ground. If you know, if you still know if, the if, if you know the yeah. word, yeah. Well, we um, have time for some questions. So, Russell. You talked about gender near the end of your talk. Is there any accommodation to the growing recognition of LGBT people in Israel? LGBT is lahatam, what we say in, yeah, yeah. in Hebrew? Look, I will say this very carefully. Uh, uh, we, we did not solve yet the male and female problem in the Hebrew language. <laughs> So the, there, there is a line, I mean, and we will solve everything eventually. But, but right now, the Hebrew, as, as it was, of course, did not recognize this uh, 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 people. Uh, what we, we, we have a special word in, Hebrew, in modern Hebrew, which is initials. Lahatab is lesbian, homosexuals, uh, 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 and... and uh, we use it, and we, we know uh, 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 about them, and we, we meet, and we talk, and we have friends, and everything. But the language will adapt to, the, to this in its, own, in its own way, in its own uh, uh, pace. You cannot force the people 
we have an Academy of the Hebrew Language. Every half a year, the Academy of the Hebrew Language very proudly gives us a hundred new words uh, that they devised and thought about uh, to use uh, in modern times. One day they will give us the words you are asking for. And I think the percentage of success of, of these new words, it may be one percent and a half of, of the words they offer us, will be accepted by the public. On the other hand, the people, the public, are making up new words all the time, and they are uh, uh, immediately, uh, for example, the word for frustration uh, suggested by the academy was mapach, hmm. mapach, because you, we have mapach nefesh in old Hebrew, which is some kind of uh, frustration. Um, nobody used it, but one of the suggestions when they were discussing the, the different options. One of them was tiskul, mm -hmm. and this was somehow it's, it, it was known to the public, and it, in two days everybody was saying tiskul. We have a nice new word, and mapach went down to, to, to the garbage, and nobody uses it, <laughs> and, 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 and we use tiskul, and it's very nice. So I guess one day the academy will give us uh, new names. Mapach uh, lepach. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, new names for, for the Lahatab, and we will either use it or invent uh, our own words for it. <laughs> it, 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 needs, it needs terminology, it needs uh, words, but it, it, it will happen in, an, in a natural uh, uh, rhythm. Yes? Is there any uh, accommodation now to people who are uncomfortable with gender terms? That we, themselves look, there are many people in Israel, whether the people who belong to more conservative uh, sectors of, 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 of uh, the country. We have uh, uh, Jewish uh, ultra-Orthodox people. We have uh, 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 Arab uh, uh, people who do not uh, recognize not, uh, uh, the, the homosexual, homosexuality. Uh, at all. I mean, not all of them, but, the, but there is a great majority, like in our ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, society. So there is an objection to even have a word for it. In the Bible, we have a, a word for uh, homosexuals. It is called either Maases Dom or Mishkav Zachar. We don't have a word for a lesbian, but we do have a word for lesbian in the Talmud which means the language evolved. So I guess it will evolve uh, uh, further to describe all kind of human phenomena. What is it in the Talmud, lesbian? Nashim mesolalot. Mesolalot zo bazo. Ze nechmad dafka. Here, where's the mic? Miriam? So I have a question about, I'm a bit uncomfortable with the way you use the word foreign uh, some of the time, because, um, well, I'm a Yiddishist, first of all. And when I learned modern Hebrew, I, I noticed that lots of things were translated, translated quite literally, uh, idiomatic expressions like, uh, to put a sick head into a well bed or something like that, or to a well okay. head into a sick bed. So a lot of the people who revived modern Hebrew were Russian speakers or Yiddish speakers or both, and the syntax and the idioms are not um, from the biblical times. There's some kind of a fusion that took place Sorry. between modern European and ancient Hebrew. So is it really foreign? What's foreign when you're looking at that? Yes, I understand English terms and Arabic terms are indeed foreign, but I think when it comes to Yiddish, for example, kedochas is a good Yiddish word, and maybe it, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not something you but wish it's, on it's somebody. A Hebrew, no, no, it's a Hebrew word from the Bible, but with Yiddish pronunciation. Well, it's but, it, Kadachat. but uh, about Kadachat is in the Bible. But five percent of Yiddish is from Hebrew, 
So okay. it, is it really, you know, it's, it's, you can't just say it's not, uh, it took on different meanings and different uses. No, maybe if you give another example, because there is a word that we all use in Hebrew called Kadachat. It comes from the Bible and everything is fine. So the Yiddish speakers say Kadoches, it's their problem. It's not, uh, <laughs> we, we have this word from the Bible. It's, uh, yeah. And, okay, and we have anyway, more. Use it. We, like, have, we more have the Fargen, for example. Questions. We'll go to the other side in the back. A student? Um, given the rapid pace of change of the modern Hebrew language, what advice do you have for someone like me who's trying to learn Hebrew? Um, through, um, I'm going to be taking it in university courses, and then also, if, I don't know if you know what Duolingo is, it's, a, it's an app. Uh, where you can learn it through a small lessons each day before I can start those classes. So if you have any advice, you know, lear it, would learning Hebrew slowly then give me an outdated version of Hebrew? And would it not be le <laughs> worth learning? Well, well I, I think you should take a course in Hebrew. There are in America, there are uh, uh, classes for, for modern spoken Hebrew. I just met a couple of days ago the, a teacher from Brandeis University in, in, in Boston. They have a very special way of teaching Hebrew, very successful. They have a lot of students, both Jewish and not Jewish, who come to study Hebrew. The best thing to do is to come to Israel and go to an ulpan. Ulpan is the, the special term. It's, by the way, an Aramaic word, originally. <laughs> uh, uh, ulpan is the special school for, for Hebrew, for, for immigrants or for anybody who, who wants to, to study Hebrew. And they will teach you the Hebrew of the, of the modern day speaker and reader, you will not be able to read Agnon very easily after the Ulpan, but you will be able to read the daily paper and talk to people and do, do your shopping and, uh, and find friends in Israel. I think that they are very efficient. Yeah. In the front. Thank you. Uh, delightful lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question about translations um, yes. and the books that you've written being translated into other languages. And specifically, which language do you think lends itself to best representing the original work that you had? Is it um, English, German, French? Do you have any thoughts about Look, that? I, I, I'm translated to 27 languages. Uh, if there are students here that heard me at noon, at, in the early afternoon, I. I'm going to repeat myself, I apologize. Um, and uh, the only translation I can read and understand is the English one. I, I, I hear great things about my translation to Russian. Uh, in, in Israel, there are many people who can read me in, both in Russian and in Hebrew, and they tell me that the Russian, the, my books in Russian are far better than, than in Hebrew. <laughs> so I'm happy for my translators about it. <laughs> Uh, I know, I, I, I ask readers in different countries, how, how do they feel with the... So I understand that uh, in, in, in Dutch and in uh, Russian and in German, I have very good uh, translators, and in English I can testify myself. My Dutch uh, translator is also the fastest uh, one, and uh, the, the, the Dutch publishers are very quick to translate books because many Dutch people can read German and they are afraid they will read the same book in German. So they try to do it before the, the Germans. So I, I, say, I always say that uh, when I write a novel and, and I get stuck, I call my Dutch translator to ask what happens in the next chapter <laughs> be, because he is already uh, there. <laughs> but but uh, but one thing I do with my translators, even in languages I cannot understand, I translated to Turkish, Bulgarian, Japanese, Chinese. So, so uh, I, I ask them to read me aloud a page. I want to listen, even if I don't understand, I want to listen if it has the music of a story. And I tell them which page I want, and, and I sit uh, on, uh, with the phone and the book, and I, I see the <coughs> Hebrew while they read. And because it, it, w when I write, 
I, especially in children's books, but also in, 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 in my novels, sometimes I read aloud to myself the Hebrew in order to hear it, not only to look at it and see if I have a, a, mu a music in the text. It's very important. That because comes the, back to the biblical text, which the, originally also was the, the original, in every language, the first stories were heard, not read. It all started with the, the people who were sitting in the cave and then told what happened today uh, outside. Yes, Dan, we'll get the mic. Hi. In, within Israel itself, do you see any difference in the spoken language among various Israeli groups, such as secular is, Israelis compared to ultra-Orthodox? There are differences. Look, when, when, when Yehuda started his revolution uh, of reviving the Hebrew, the Orthodox people were very much against him. They even, uh, 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 how would I say, Shin, to squeal? To... They, uh, 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 what's the English, yeah, what's the English? They ma made him, snitched him, snitched. Snitched? Snitched. Snitched. It's a slang or a word? No, it's okay. okay. <laughs> they snitched about him to the, to the Ottoman Turkish uh, 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 regime, that he is a spy, that he is against the Turks because of his activity. They put him to prison uh, be, because of that. And today, many of them uh, uh, use Hebrew in the street. When they, I see families of ultra-Orthodox Jews with all their costumes and hats and everything, and they, they talk. They talk uh, Hebrew, very modern Hebrew, mm. uh, updated with slang expressions and everything to each other. But still, you, there is a different accent. Mm -hmm. There are differences of accent between different uh, countries of origin of people who, who come to. Uh, we, th this is a, 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 another interesting issue, is the, um, the way different uh, groups uh, um, left their original accent, for example, we don't say the ayn and the het anymore. Um, some older people in the Yemenite uh, or Iraqi or, or Egyptian communities still keep it, but the younger generation stopped, stopped using it. Uh, on the other hand, the Ashkenazi uh, uh, left their their um, uh, uh, emphasis on the on on the syllable. Uh, for example, uh, the poem of uh, of uh, Bialik, Shalom Rav Shuvech Tzipora Nechmedet, was pronounced Shalom Rav Shuvach Tzipora Nechmedet. Mm -hmm. So so it is also changed. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a process of un unification, but mm -hmm. it's a slow one. People of the Galilee, for example, did not pronounce V, but only B. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, they did not have a Vav. Uh, the, 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 ot, the letter Bet was always uh, like B in English. So other people were mocking at them, uh, saying, as bubim is to bebim sabim lachabit se lachala balaban. I cannot translate it to, to, to English. <laughs> This disappeared already. So uh, the, the, there are differences, but uh, it's, it's, for example, the Iraqi people still pronounce the K with emphasis. They would say K, K, deep, much deeper. Uh, um, but the, the younger generation pronounce it like any other young, young person in Israel. I think we will relocate. We won't run away. And uh, Mayor Shalev, of course, will sign the books and will be open for questions. It's a long way from Herzl, who thought you cannot buy a train ticket in Hebrew. And of course, nobody would speak that antiquated language. Uh, he, he thought everybody today. will talk German. Yes. So thank you very much, and thank you all for coming.